Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash Agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. All right, welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight, a panel of talented coaches and uh, some of my very good friends in the Agile world. Let's start with Diane Zajak-Woody. Diane, how are you tonight? I'm doing fine. Thanks, Ryan. Zach Boniker, welcome back to the show, my friend. Been way too long since we've talked. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you can remember my name. This is exciting. <laughs> Happy to be back. Thanks, Ryan. You're a tough guy to get, Zach, but I'm glad you joined us. I'm a Ty Schleier. How you doing, buddy? Not bad. Nice to be back. It's always great to have all of you with us. Diane, this is your first, but I hope uh, the first of many shows with us. Uh, so welcome, and uh, hopefully you enjoy your first experience in podcasting. I'm optimistic. <laughs> so I've pulled this, uh, this great panel of coaches together because I'm curious about a path to becoming an Agile coach, and not just a path, but many paths, because as we'll probably get into... You know, Diane, I think you came into the uh, Agile coaching world from the, the business analyst path. Yep. And I know, yep. Zach, you came in as programmer to project management to traditional management to coach. And then Amitai, programmer straight into the Agile coach hot seat. So there's a lot of ways to get to Rome, many roads to Rome, but they all led to Agile coach. And so I know many out there want to be coaches, are early down the path of becoming a coach. And I thought it might be neat if the, the four of us could talk about how you all grew your coaching skills and what got you moving in the agile coaching direction from your traditional or from your more traditional roles within companies and organizations. So I guess, Diane, if you'd be so kind and, and kind of talk about that first, you know, how did you grow your agile coaching skills and, and ultimately make the leap into becoming an agile coach? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think... What was huge for me was the influence of uh, actually the coaches that I had in the organization I was in when I first was sort of learning the Agile way. Um, I, as you said, I was a business analyst for many years, uh, I think six or seven years in total. Um, by the end of that, the last four years or so, we're in this sort of Agile space and it was very inspirational to me to hear these coaches and to kind of see what they were doing and and watch how they facilitated discussions and they were teaching us things. And there was a pivotal moment for me where one of the coaches, we were actually, we were like at a happy hour or something and we were, and he looked at me and said, the big, the big question you need to answer is whether you want to make great things or make things great. And it was a big moment for me to be like, oh, because at the time I felt like I was making things. I was part of this team and we were starting to gel and we were starting to do great things. But I knew that it wasn't completely satisfying to me. So the idea of making things great and actually influencing at a larger level was really appealing to me. So that kind of sparked the like, oh, I do have a choice. I don't have to just stay in this uh, role of being somebody on a team. Um, so, you know, in terms of learning for me, it was very much about talking to people and reading as much as I could get my hands on and having conversations we've been having on this call, just sort of learning what worked for other people. Um, so I, I really have picked up whatever I can, uh, wherever I can get it. I just have a voracious appetite for learning. And I guess that made me a good BA that curiosity. Um, and now I'm using that to, to try to be the best coach I can be. I'm, I'm curious about Zach and Amitai, how they came about. 
Oh, I'm I'm really curious about Amatai, so he should go next. <laughs> <laughs> go for it, go for it Amatai. Well, uh, one detail that I think is salient is that I did come from a uh, most recently from a programming role into coaching, but uh, a little bit around that, and also about a decade ago, I was doing other kinds of management, uh, team management, and a little bit of product management. Uh, and that definitely, especially the first time I did it about a decade ago, uh, was really eye-opening because I was coming from like programmer, IT, uh, total systematic and uh, maybe not so much with the theory of mind. And I went into a role where all of a sudden I'm not just doing, you know, IT support, I'm responsible for uh, a variety of departments uh, in an organization that need a variety of types of support because they have a variety of personalities and a variety of organizational structures. And I'm responsible for six or seven people who have responsibilities to those departments, uh, each of which of those people has a variety of personalities and proclivities. And then when they're out, I got to be able to back (laughs) them up. Uh, And so that for me was just a rude awakening. Uh, I, I had no idea what I was doing and all of a sudden I had to figure it out because I was the face of this operation. And, uh, I think that that sort of planted a seed, but then I went back and did other stuff for a while. And it was recently when I was uh, at first hired as a programmer and then moved into team lead uh, and then product manager that I realized uh, something that I find really satisfying about being a programmer on a team. Uh, some of it's the code. I really like that. But what is really the best for me about being on a team are the behaviors that wind up being the coaching behaviors the uh, getting myself and others oriented in any kind of a problem space, uh, teasing out what the right questions are to ask so we can figure out what what direction to try taking a step, Uh, understanding what's at risk if we make a mistake, and bringing out the best in each other, and just looking out for the problem to be solved without my ego being the thing that I'm trying to serve. And that's what I loved about being on a team when it was a great team. And I realized uh, gradually through a few interactions with coaches, that that was a path I could be on. So I'm curious if you ever had a, a coach in your early days, Amitai, or was this all self-taught or self-inspiring? Or I absolutely have had coaches. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is my friend Nathan Arthur. Uh, in my mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. first programming job, so I had, I had gone to college uh, for about a year. I had dropped out. Uh, I went to work for a dot-com back in 2000, 2001. And at that point, I knew basically nothing about programming, just enough to kind of smash some keywords together and sometimes get something out the other end. And uh, after about a year at the dot-com, where I was doing tech support for the people in the office, but also uh, being the webmaster and also, in theory, having time to develop the web product that was the thing that made our money, if we made money, which we didn't. Uh, After about a year of that, Nathan, who'd been keeping an eye on me, decided that it was time to bring me in at his workplace and they were an XP shop. They did extreme programming. They had really smart people that paid attention to what they were doing as they were doing it. And Nathan at this point, who had been a grown-up the entire time, which I was not, still am not, uh, put his reputation on the line. It was considerable with his company because he'd been doing great work and people looked to him. And he went to whichever leadership had hiring power and he said, I know this looks strange, but I think uh, Amitai, this college dropout who doesn't know anything about programming, could be a really good hire. And, and they took his bet, and he said, I'm going to be the one that, that trains him up, and he did. Uh, and that was sort of the beginning of my exposure to object orientation in general, Java in particular, test driving, although I didn't really understand it very well yet, uh, and just all the other activities like pairing that those were imprinted on me, even though I didn't really understand them at the time because I had no basis for comparison how software development even works. Uh, but about a decade later, when I was really you know, trying to deal with these real problems on my own, then I really learned it. And it's because I got lucky in my first programming job to have a coach like Nathan who knew that there was more in me and helped me start to bring it out. Well, see, so I guess I'm curious about that word luck because it's something that I've thought a lot about. And Ryan, as you talk about how do you go forward, um, I think I have determined that it's not luck. I think that there are people in our lives that recognize skills, competencies, um, passion that we have, and they recognize it and 
acknowledge it and I guess you could say reward it by giving you opportunities to do more with it. That's something that shifted for me because I used to just think I was lucky. And now as I work with teams, I recognize those same people. And I think it's not lucky that I'm noticing them. It is because of traits that they have that I am now going to perhaps um, give them special attention or sort of mentor these people who have attributes that would make them conducive to perhaps being the champion after I leave. Um, so I, that's just something uh, that was helpful for me is to sort of forget about the word luck because not much in life, as I've learned, is about luck. It's about how we carry ourselves and how we kind of go through life. I would argue, just I would say it's it. lucky for those people that you were there to observe that someone else <laughs> might not have observed. Uh, perhaps. Everything happens for a reason, but that's a whole nother philosophical discussion. I don't, I don't want to derail us too much, but I'm, I'm still thinking about luck, Diane. And, and, and for you, I, I sense that you, you felt very strongly about what you've discovered and realized in your journey and, and, and your experiences. But does it ha- can, can it be both? Does it have to be? I mean, for, for you, it may not be luck. I um, personally sure, feel like where I, I went, I went was luck. So it makes me wonder does it, <laughs> if it matters, you know, is it luck or not? I don't know. Maybe, maybe we just take or we, we, we create it for ourselves or we do get lucky and, and maybe it's what, what we do with it. But I know for me, getting started on this was pure luck. I mean, pure luck. Well, but I, I think for me, the frame of mind was really important because when I thought it was lucky, I stayed at the company I was in for a long time. When I started to recognize that I contributed to the circumstances I was in and I had abilities and and competencies that were actually valuable and it wasn't just time and circumstance, then I was like, oh, wait, I'm marketable. I can actually do things. So I'm going to tie this back into the how do you get started as a coach. When you start to recognize your abilities and you start to see that other people recognize your abilities, you can start to reframe the next steps you take in your life. Mm, When it was luck, I didn't, you don't want to like plan your career on luck. Whereas if you start to say, oh, I have competencies, I can plan my career based on on my competencies and interests. That was the important thing for me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to plan my career at all. (laughs) But so I think something that ties, <laughs> well, ties that this together too, you know? is that uh, the idea of luck may be anathema to you, Diane, but the idea of there being some conditions that favor certain kinds of outcomes and that you have some say with your own actions. Would you agree that that describes what the, you know, the situations that we're in? Sure. Sort of a combination of conditions <laughs> conditions around us and also our choices about those conditions. You, you know, Amitai, I think Tim Oninger, a good friend of the show, I think he has a great word for what happened to, I think, a lot of us is uh, serendipity, right? It is a serendipitous uh, moment when we are, are paired with the, the person who mentors and coaches us to greater things. Uh, I struggle with the word luck, like I think like Diane does, that... Uh, we have to have traits, and I even think if you if you read the literature, if you look at uh, coaching agile teams by Lisa Adkins, even she lays out some traits that that are emergent in most coaches. That's not to say these traits have to be in all coaches, but most coaches are curious, most coaches are introspective, most coaches have these very particular traits that are visible to other people who are looking for those things, and so you have to be present, and you have to show up, and you have to do the work. And to me, there's no luck involved in that. You either do it or you don't. But I think it is very serendipitous when someone acknowledges and appreciates and honors the work you're doing and decides to, to mentor you and, and put you in a direction that's going to make your life better and, and also the lives of those who you end up coaching down the road. Does that, does that make more sense? The idea of serendipity makes a lot of sense to me. And that's, that's where yeah, I think I, I feel that more comfortable you know, <laughs> talking about this. So, so my journey was... I, I looked around at, at everything that was in the corporate world and, and disliked it. And I disliked how people, you know, didn't seem to, didn't seem to care to change anything, right? Where you have managers that were wielding their power, 
You had people that were on, you know, unhappy at work with a difficult work environments, and nobody really seemed engaged or to care, right? And that was just my 50,000 foot observation of the company I was working at. And so when I discovered Agile, that was just because I was leaving the programming world because I wasn't a great programmer. And but I got introduced to it and it got me curious and I started figuring out how I can apply it in my company. And then I started the people that I was working on, the teams that I was, you know, basically managing. I started caring more about their success than mine because I wanted to give them an environment for them to be great because I thought that's the only thing that really matters, right? Um, and and that just led to, you know, me starting to practice and experiment with Agile. And, and then when a new director came into the company, the company that I was at a long, long time ago, um, had a, almost a 14-month lead time to get code to or to, to get products and changes, you know, value to customers. I mean, more than a year. It was crazy long. And so they had signed some contracts that that was <laughs> you had to start getting some things out the door a lot faster. So this new director was hired, and she was kind of an agile thinker. And it pretty much found that she discovered me because I was practicing some stuff in a different department and said, ah, there's an ally, promoted me to work for her and said, we need to, we need to start a transformation. We need to change and I'm going to rely on you to do it. Wow. That was luck. I, 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 <laughs> I, I got a, 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 an environment, like a scenario handed to me to try out and experiment and learn from in a really safe to fail way because nobody knew any better. Um, and, and that's what, what got me going is I was able to just connect knowledge to experience, which is pretty amazing in, in a way that every time I failed, I could just learn from it. And nobody, you know, <laughs> nobody was going to punish me for it or anything. And and I don't I don't know where I would have gone if I wouldn't have had that opportunity. So maybe that's ser- maybe serendipity just feels a little better. I mean, obviously I, I I pursued my interests. I gravitated towards the things that were of interest to me. But man, if I wouldn't have had the opportunity to work on the scale that I did and to experiment on the scale I did, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how fast I would have learned or even what I would have learned. I don't know where I'd be today, and it was it was a great I mean, it was a great thing. Serendipity that, that just feels right. So it sounds like it, it's quite a journey, no matter which direction you you decide <laughs> to come from. I mean, it, there's a lot of learning, introspection, curiosity, but there there's a scary part to it as well, right? I mean, there's there's obviously a risk, and so where what are the scary bits when you start uh, down this path, and maybe Amitai? Can you share some of the, the scary moments and some of the scary thoughts and the things that that could uh, that could derail you if you don't if you're not ready to guard against it? Well, uh, I think I would start by framing it that there are the the things to be afraid of that are out there in the situation, and there are things to be afraid of that are in our own heads about the situation. And I think the things that I were afraid of were more the ones in my own head. So, for instance, uh, I personally, for a lot of reasons, have an allergy to coercion. I just cannot stand uh, being forced to do something or forcing someone else to do something. Or the allergy part is even being perceived that I'm forcing someone else to do something. Uh, It's very important to me that when people are doing things, especially when I'm a part of them, that we're doing it of our own choice at all times. And so what I was afraid of in my head was... I'm, I'm new to this. The worst thing that could possibly happen is that I somehow persuade or finagle or am perceived as a powerful consultant that people have to go along with, wind up making people do things that they didn't want to do. That was like my worst case scenario. Uh, and in practice, people were doing things they didn't want to do all the time when I got there. <laughs> Uh, but I, I didn't have the, the perspective to see it that way. I was just concerned about me, my choices, my actions, and the possible impact those would have. And I didn't realize until I really got into it, there's no way to act in a system like this when it's this upside down, inside out, uh, interactive force, power, all that kind of stuff. There's no way to act in that system that doesn't you know, push the power around somewhere and bounce back somewhere. I'm part of it now. Even if I'm an outsider, I'm part of it now. And so I think I, I hyper-corrected because of my fear that I didn't, you know, I'm normally kind of a forceful personality. I'm, I'm, I have my opinion. I'll tell you what it is. You don't have to agree with me, but you'll hear about it. Uh, and I really tamped that down, I think probably to a, to a detrimental effect, because the people that I was working with who were used to 
being told what to do, expect that a consultant will be somebody who will tell them what to do. And so in that sense, uh, the thing that I was afraid of wound up putting me in a position where I let them down. Mm. So I had some similarities. Uh, again, the mental games that you play with yourselves. One of my big fears early on was that pressure that the team expected you to have all the answers. You know, you walk in the door, you've barely met people, brand new team, and they're like, what do we do? And I'm like, I yeah. don't know, I've just met you. Like, <laughs> there's this sort of admitting, you, you know, that you don't have all the answers in a way that maintains your credibility, but also helps them discover for themselves what it is that was a, a learning curve for me, trying to figure out, because I was used to having all the answers. In my role before I, I quit, I was very much the person that people went to because I knew how to get things done and I knew who to talk to and I was used to be being the go-to person. And as a coach, I had to basically push that aside and say, no, okay, I'm here to have all the answers. I'm here to work with you. I'm here to help you discover the best solutions. Very context-driven. Like that was fine for me philosophically, but to put it in practical use was a, a challenge for me. I had to learn how to do that while maintaining credibility with teams. Because you're absolutely right. My experience matches yours that people think, oh, you're the consultant, so you're here to tell us what to do. And it's a, it's a mind shift to say, well, not exactly. I mean, I can give you some ideas, but I'm here to help you help uh, to think differently and to, to discover the best solutions for your specific context. And by the way, Amitai, you probably shouldn't have kids if you don't want to tell people what to do. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah I, I, I had a similar path that uh, that Diane and Amitai had, at least from you know the perspective of of that initial fear. But the fear was even a little deeper, and it was a lot more selfish. But I think it's very real for for new coaches, especially those of us who come from project management or management. In that my fear was that I was about to become invisible. Uh, I was no longer at the front leading the charge. What do you mean by that? In a management role, in a project management role, you're, you're front and center. You are, in a, in a traditional organization, you're the throat to choke. You are the, the person on the line. And so you're very visible and the value that you bring to the team is very apparent at all times. But when you switch to an agile coaching role, you're, you're really leading from the back of the room and you're, you're guiding and asking powerful questions and you're mentoring on Agile, which is where I think you have your most authority. But when the team's presenting and the team is solving, they're doing that on their own and it's not always apparent to the outside uh, the value that you bring. And so I was very worried initially about being invisible, but actually ended up finding a ton of satisfaction uh, and a ton of self-worth and the idea that I was helping the team make their lives and their product better, and that fear went away because the team knew the value that was being brought. But initially, it was that that invisible feeling or that sense of kind of falling to the side and not being front and center that I really struggled with for a very long time. It's interesting listening to the three of you because all of what you say I, I feel or have experienced, but it it isn't fear or being scared. These are just kind of those uncomfortable moments that, you know, sometimes I have an answer for and sometimes I don't care to answer, you know, and, and it just makes me feel a little uncomfortable. Uh, getting into coaching, what really scared me was the realization that, and, and I guess I'm talking more <clears throat> along the lines of professional coaching, not necessarily just as an agile coach, but the idea of, of coaching people is a opt-in invite type of platform you know it's not something that you go and say I, I need to coach you now um, it's something that people come to you for you create the invitation for them to take I'm giving you something to take advantage of and when they take it God when I started I was so afraid I'd let them down what what happens if they come to me with a real problem something that is really affecting them and their teammates or their work or something and I I can't help them. I can't open enough windows for them and doors and lenses to see it. And they, they leave and go, thanks for that invitation. That was a waste of my time. And I, I mean, that, that was a terrifying thing for me to really feel like I was going to let somebody down like that. Um, and I don't know. I, I think I still feel it today. I, I, I think that is the thing that, that scares me is 
what if, what if I let someone down? Like, what if, what if I can't help them bring, what if I can't bring them up to take the great, the great leap that they want to take? What if I can't support them and they fall? That, that is an accountability point that we all share in that we are telling and, and, and presenting and modeling a way of working and a way of life that can be better for people, that can improve their lives and, and improve their happiness. And to not make that goal, I, I think you're right, Zach, it is very scary to not get them there, especially when you've shown them what things could be. So I think that one's very important. I appreciate that. You know, that puts me in mind of uh, another thing that's it's not as immediate a fear, but it is a fear when you start to think about, now that I've done some coaching, what kind of effect am I likely to have as I continue to do this? And it seems like a really common pattern is that, especially in, say, a big enterprise where it, it can be a very frustrating place to be, people grow inured to it. They They find ways to deal with it the way that it is. And they, they lower their expectations, which is exactly what, Zach, you're saying. You're, you're maybe raising their expectations, and then how do you live up to that? Yeah. And I feel like uh, one of the very common patterns that I've heard about, I haven't seen it a lot myself yet, is that when you open people's eyes to uh, what more they can be and what more they can do, and uh, even more, you know, the context around them, how much nicer that could be versus the one that they're in, you wind up, you know, moving the best people out of this company because they wind up looking for where can they work in a context that's that's like the one that we talked about maybe like the one we briefly experienced tiny pieces of when you were here that one time for a few weeks uh and they they won't stay because the place that they are isn't going to change as fast as they're changing i've talked to a few agile coaches who basically said you know our job has basically become coaching people out of their jobs yeah. Because they won't want to stay once they get it. So <laughs> it's a yeah, sad I, truth or, or a happy truth. I don't know. And no, it's truth. I mean, I, 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 I can think of one engagement where it was there for a year and five people, five people left of, of the course of the year for exactly that reason. Wow. And <laughs> Way to go, other, Zach. And, <laughs> yeah, you must have done a great job. Thanks. <laughs> no, there was a, a another engineer and, and I think she's amazing and I, and, and she, I can sense that she wants that, the sort of things. And she's actually applied at companies that could give, but her sense of loyalty and commitment and maybe even fear of leaving, you know, being judged from leaving, she's staying. But now think about that, right? So now I have somebody who I know wants to leave, won't out of guilt. And now, so it's almost worse. Now, now you know something's out there. You're not taking it. You're miserable. If you're miserable at work, you're not going to do a great job. It's like, how... How did it come to this? You know, by just talking about maybe talking about how you feel and, and maybe attending to needs, things that you have at the workplace. Great. You know, it's, a, it's a real thing. And it, it's, it's yeah, I wish it didn't have to be that way. I don't know if that's a, if I'd call that a fear or if it's just something where I, I mean, it saddens me that, that it happens, but I don't know how to not make it happen either. So. Well, so this, this ties into something that uh, one of the reasons that when I was a, a new coach, that I think I didn't immediately fall fully flat on my face is that I had been given some expectations about what it means to succeed in coaching. Uh, I think it might have been George Dinwiddie that gave them to me. He said, you're probably going to come in bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. He might have used slightly different words. Uh, thinking about how big a dent you're going to make and how much you're going to improve the organization. Let's, let's tone it down a little bit. Think about it this way. Uh, if you improve the life of one person, you will have succeeded wildly. Yeah. And so when I think about it in those terms, which, I mean, uh, on an engagement that I was on last year, I think that I can truthfully say that I improved the life of one person. And I'm still feeling some, some pride and happiness from it when I think about it. Uh, and the rest of that situation was pretty dire, and I feel pretty terrible about the rest of it. But yeah. I did help one person a lot. Yeah, and yeah. I feel you know, if given given that context, when I think about, are we coaching people out of the organizations that are paying for us to be there? Maybe that's one of the things that happens, but maybe that's really what our job is. Yeah, no, the, the worst. I think what I shouldn't say the worst, but maybe maybe the one of the least enjoyable experiences I've had working <clears throat> was something somewhat recently, and in that experience, there was one person. I, I mean, everything truly did not go well. Uh, for for reasons that I accept were beyond my control, so that's fine. But one person, one person was able to, you know, open their eyes, so to speak, and 
And it, it was interesting just hanging on to that one, that one person and, and taking all your satisfaction from that. But then realizing as I've kept in touch with her, how she's moved on to another job. She's like learning all this stuff. She's never been more excited about work. Maybe that's okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe as long as one person can go back and contribute or do something positive, maybe, maybe it's all worth it. Yeah, absolutely. I've definitely had to switch and I hate but lowering the bar because I absolutely value people. And so like one person is more valuable than delivering, you know, X number of dollars of business value ahead of schedule. You know, it is all about the people. For, um, but I didn't really, really adopt that when I started. But as I've been doing this now a couple of years, I've definitely shifted to measuring success by the number people's lives that I have impacted in some way or another. Um, like my very first contract, it was a six month contract. And, you know, looking back on it, if you would have graded it. We could have said it was a failure. Didn't really impact much. Didn't really change a lot of thinking, but just actually it was at a path to agility or not path, excuse me, agile and beyond last couple of weeks ago at that conference, I actually talked to the, uh, the manager of the group I was helping and he just did a whole bunch of classes for this marketing group. And like, they finally were ready to continue on. And I like to think that I helped sort of sow the seed and we got things started a couple of years ago and now they're ready to move forward. And so I was really happy to hear that they're progressing, even if it wasn't in the timeline that I was there for. I like to think that I had a hand in that, in getting their, their you know, brains thinking about something new. So it's, we have to shift what we do, because uh, if you, I don't know how, um, you guys that well to know whether you're all perfectionists or whether you're you know, measuring yourself by how many things you complete, but that tends to be my, my perspective. And it's hard for me to, it was hard for me to shift to this intangible way of measuring success. And so I've learned to look for these, these other types of things. And it's been, yeah, very satisfying. Someone who's coached me a bit on this is uh, another friend of the show, Don Gray. And, and he's, he's had to remind me a number of times that the people are where they're at. And you have to meet them where they're at. You might be able to get a half step ahead of them and try to bring them along. But, but you got to speak to them where they are. And sometimes they're just not ready for the message. And so, Diane, yeah. I think in your case, it's just one of those where uh, right message, wrong time. And, but eventually they caught up to the message and it just it flourished. And there's still that seed that you planted. And so that's something that, that I know Don's coached me a few times on that, you know, you're putting ideas in people's heads. They may not be ready for them, but when they are, it'll be a bolt of inspiration. And you can still have a win uh, out of that. You still have, you know, I, I think a word just popped up on my screen, influence. And that, um, you know, that, uh, that's meaningful. Even when the, you, don't, you may not necessarily get the immediate, you know, quote unquote win, but later on when they are at a, at a place or in a space that the ideas resonate and make sense, uh, they can still do great things. And that was a very difficult lesson for me to pick up initially because I am the perfectionist. I, am the, I want yep. the win. <laughs> I want the win. And I, it's, it's almost competitive. But uh, like I'm, I, yeah, I've had to stout, I've had to just suppress some of that. But yeah. there's there's yeah. wisdom in that. That you got to meet people where they are, and sometimes they're just not ready for what you have to say. Yeah, my husband actually helped me with that. We were discussing uh, this the client I was working for, and they were just a cluster. They were a mess, and and, and I knew I wasn't going to change anything grand, but I still thought that I could. And at the end of that engagement. You know, I was trying, I was struggling with like, okay, what good did I do? And he was like, you know what? You're just used to being an A student. You want to get a, a grade that's an A. And maybe for this, you know, particular engagement, you didn't get the A. But that doesn't mean you didn't change someone's life. And it, it switched to like, okay, I don't care about grades anymore. It's not about the grades. It's about the people and the impact. So it's, it's been a journey for me. But it, it's funny how it kind of goes into your other parts of your life. I, I feel like so many other parts of my life, I am relaxing and not caring about grades. So this yeah. change in my career, you know, has made my entire life better. Yeah, it's done so. the same for me. Definitely done the same for me. 
Um, when you try to when you try to anchor some of the the thoughts and, and you try to anchor some of these practices and have them carry into the rest of your life, you know, what are the things that you guys try to keep in mind? You know, what do you try to keep focused on? You know, I guess maybe a, a, a more interesting way to frame this would be, you know, what's on the post-it note next to your monitor that, <laughs> that you're constantly looking at, trying to keep you know front of front of mind. My my post-it just has you know a reminder to myself which is just be kind because and that means to people and myself i tend to be hard on myself um i don't know i don't know if that's a common you know coaching you know trait or not but i'm very hard on myself and sometimes i have to just remind myself that i'm enough sometimes which is hard for me um but the other is listen is is listening and and you know like real true listening to people um that that's something that's proven to be harder for me than than I thought when I when when I first discovered the levels of listening and all the different science around listening and it's like okay cool and this this aligns with coaching really well cool so I'm going to start practicing and learning listening so um, under the advice of um, you know great coaches I, I think it was actually Lisa Adkins at one of her classes she said okay cool come up with a word that that when you realize you're going to your inner monologue use the word reset your mind come back to listening I was like oh this is this is good so i'm going to practice that i'm just going to see how many times i use my refocus and listen to somebody word you know on a daily basis and i, I think the first time i tried it i think i i tallied like 60 something marks i mean it was insane wow. <laughs> and i thought to myself wow look how you know visual like like you know visual management we're, we're agile people we like visual management so look at that look at all these tallies these are the number of times that basically I listened with the intent of responding rather than really caring what the other person was saying. That's, that is me. I need to, ch I need to change that. So I, I, I did this thing where I said, I'm, I'm going to work constantly on trying to get that number down. And my goal being three, three times a day. Right. And nine months later, I did that for the first time. And over those nine months, I was exhausted. I mean, I've never been more tired <laughs> in my life than trying to learn how to really listen. Um, and uh, if, if it's true that we like to <clears throat> regress back to what's familiar and, and we know that as coaching or as coaches that people do that, for me, listening is, has something that's easy to fall back and, and re regress on. So I, you know, I keep it as a reminder. You have to make sure that you continue to focus on when a conversation occurs and someone is talking to you, all the power, all the, and I don't mean power in a way that, you know, like I want the power, but all the power you have to be able to, to, you know, to influence or to, to really coach in a conversation, all the power comes by talking as little as possible, right? Cause that's where you get all the, when you're listening, you're getting the information, you're, you're, you're getting the information you need to ask the right questions. Like Amitai was talking about to detangle this web, you've got to listen, right? And as soon as you get into your inner monologue, you stop. So that's my, my reminder, just kind of kindness and listening. That's an yeah, awesome that's story that you were able to observe that in yourself and then manage your way slowly and incrementally to the way that you wanted to be behaving. That's really cool. I almost gave up. I almost gave up about a month into it when I hadn't really prayed because it is hard. I mean, if you think about how many times in the course of even just listening, you know, to the, 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 the three of you listening to me talk. I mean, at some point, if I start rambling, you probably come back and be like, you know, I wonder what's for dinner. You know, it's easy for you <laughs> to just, to just lose it. But to I'm up to, I'm up to 72 right now. <laughs> what? Just with me talking <laughs> 72 times in the last five minutes. Jesus, man. Zach, I'm learning. I'm, I'm trying to get better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Clearly, clearly I'm a, I'm a real instructional, instructional tool here. Um, okay. but, Actually, but it's, <laughs> It's it's true though. It's 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 really easy for us to really care about what we're going to say next. And once you master the ability to you you kind of realize the 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 feeling you get when you're really listening to somebody from a point of curiosity, it's pretty amazing. Like questions just come to your mind. Like you just start really wanting to know. Um, and it's it's yeah. It, it, uh, it was it was exhausting. I mean, I, talk, talk about Diane. Talk about you know measuring a. a you know, outcomes that you can't see or feel. Imagine, 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 I said, what'd you do all day? I did absolutely nothing. All I did was just listen to people all day long, really intently. And I'm exhausted. <laughs> I need to go to bed early tonight, you know, but that's how I felt. It was draining. People who know what listening means would totally understand that. 
you know, maybe you and I are similar, Ryan, with the competitiveness, but I'm always trying to like one up other people. And now in so many ways, whether it's comp- teams, we all know we shouldn't do that. Let's stop comparing teams and, and with coaching, there's no way you can compare two to coaches. We're all so different and unique and we bring different qualities and strengths into the teams we work with that trying to compare is just going to rob me of any joy that I do. So that in, in my personal life, that has been equally as, as impactful. Um, so that's a huge thing. So you guys should not compare your numbers of times listening. That would be bad. So. <laughs> what, was, <laughs> what, was that quote, what was your quote, Diane? Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. That, mm. you know, that, that is such a important swing thought or coaching thought. Mm. I think especially for trying to coach multiple scrum teams and programs and because yeah. th- there's so much temptation. Let's compare velocity. Mm-hmm. Let's compare oh. value delivered per sprint. Let's deliver or let's uh, let's compare all these things that are not comparable. You know, let's let's compare an apple and an orange and see which one is better. I'm concerned because I have yeah. an awful lot of genuine tests that are the thief of joy. <laughs> 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 oh, don't exactly. look out for me here on the die. We're keeping this at the hot. <laughs> you know, Diane, it sounds like we do have some very similar tendencies and, and personality traits because of the competitiveness. It's one that I've had to, to tone down to. And, and what I have often put on a post it note, I stole straight from Lisa Adkins and her wonderful book, uh, Coaching Agile Teams. It's Take It to the Team. So I don't, I used to fear, and I, and I, you know, I think all of us mentioned this at one point, you know, what happens if we don't know the answer? I don't fear that anymore because there's, you know, six plus or minus three people on a scrum team who are smarter than me collectively who are going to help me figure it out. And together we're going to figure it out. And uh, for me, it's just remembering that there's a team there that uh, I should be taking things to and, and coaching them on how to solve their own problems and not trying not try to have all the answers myself. Absolutely. I have always relied on the, the kind of wisdom of the crowds. Um, I've just seen so many times. That was probably the biggest lesson from my first Agile coach was just that one of us can't solve it, but all of us can figure out a way to, to come up with a solution. That's why, I, I mean, I think my the things I enjoy the most are retrospectives, different brainstorming techniques, facilitation, because I really love to tap into the wisdom of the group. So that's something that brings me a lot of joy. Yeah, that's... that's and I'm gonna, the, oh, go, go ahead, Diane, sorry. No, I was just going to say that, but even that, like, I'm going to do it differently than someone else. Like, I might borrow someone's technique for doing a retro, but I know I'm going to bring my own unique slant to it, and I'm going to change some things, and so I don't try to do things exactly like someone else. Uh, I, I quickly learned that I need to do it my way. I need to be authentic to who I am and my, you know, personality and my strengths. So, yeah, authenticity is another important keyword to to pull out of this whole discussion. It's, you know, I think we've all, even throughout this conversation, have tried to bring our whole selves to the conversation, to be present, to be vulnerable, to be honest. You know, we're sharing fears and concerns and and failures and and the things that. That, that have hung us up and in, in a way to try to be authentic about the path to an agile coach. And that's it. The same applies when working with teams. I have found that, you know, when I would pontificate on for the sake of hearing my own voice or to sound clever, the team catches on quickly and zones out. They know when, when you're just talking to, to fill space, but when you're truly authentic uh, and those are the moments and it's not always, it's not a hundred percent of the time, right? You know, sometimes there are just the, gosh, I'm exhausted and I'm going to give a one-liner about the virtues of Agile and move on to the next thing. But during those truly authentic moments, I think we make our greatest impacts. Absolutely. Vulnerability is a big thing for me. I feel like that's been something that I started out not even realizing that I was doing it. I've just been very, I've always been one who can share We were joking earlier about being self-deprecating, but to me, that's about authenticity. It's let's be honest about what we're afraid of, what we're not good at, all that sort of thing. And that has allowed people, I think, to trust me. I'm able to extend basically trust. I'm saying, all right, I trust you enough that you're not going to judge me when I tell you that 
I am struggling with this thing. And so by me extending my vulnerability, others tend to extend their vulnerability to me. So it's mm. something that just sort of came naturally to me. But now as I'm, I'm kind of discovering more science behind things and trying to figure out what, why do people do what they do, I realize that it's something that has been very powerful in my life as I look back. So it's something I try to continue to do. And I that encourage means, other people to do that too. Yeah. That's very true in my experience as well. Uh, I discovered uh, in some introspection uh, in a training course with Alistair Coburn that one of my go-to moves, maybe my the go-to move for me, uh, in any team context, whether I'm coaching or on the team, is to lower my apparent social status. And maybe that's a move that I have available because I'm a white dude with a deep voice that sounds thoughtful and has a big vocabulary. <laughs> and so it's easy for me to, to lower it because I'm comfortable with the status that I probably actually have. But uh, it's a go-to move for me. And what I like to do specifically is make the first mistake and be totally visible and public about it and model through my behavior that that's actually totally fine and we can all have ideas and they don't all have to be right and there's no problem. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask what, what that, that might look like to lower your, you know, your, your status. Um, that's a, I think I've, I'm, it's funny you say that, I'm just sitting here thinking about it and then reflecting on the, fr the time I, I started working in this current you know, work I'm doing. And I did exactly that, and I guess I didn't realize. I wonder why I did that. I just instinctually went to do something, and I knew it wasn't going to be. I think I just wanted to see it fail or something so that I could get more information on what to do next. But in doing so, yeah, you're absolutely right. I was able to leverage it. I was able to come back and say, see, everyone, it's okay to learn. It's okay to, to, to you know, as long as we can do it quickly and we can understand, you know, kind of what we're working towards or what our ideas are. It's, it's okay if it doesn't go right. Uh, it helps us understand what to do next. And yeah, uh, that's funny. I did that yeah. and I didn't realize it was a move. Now I, now I can say I know Almatai's move. That's awesome. <laughs> I feel like this is a Seinfeld episode waiting to happen. Hey, so, so did you ever notice that uh, I didn't get to tell you my, uh, my sticky on my monitor that reminds me what to think about? What oh, yes, that? go ahead. That was my form of observational humor. Did you ever notice? <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> What I have to do, one of them might seem really sensible and one of them might seem really weird. Uh, the one that might seem sensible is get out of my head because <laughs> I live very thoroughly inside my own head, but that is not where the things are actually happening. And my head is not the one that's interesting right now when I'm coaching. So I have to remind myself over and over again to get out of there and, and don't hang is out Is that there. the weird one? That's, that's the, the weird that's one the or the smart one? That's the sensible one, right? Oh, that's, that's sensible. I can't wait to hear the weird one. one? <laughs> I thought it was the sensible one. Maybe I need to get out of my head. But so that's, that's one. And then the one that might seem a little strange, because coaching is very much about being in the moment with the person or people that you're with. The other thing that I have to remember sometimes, because by default I won't remember it at all, is to get out of right now. I'm the kind of person that I'm kind of like a dog like whatever's happening right now is everything and I'm totally in it and I'm subsumed by it and my senses are all attuned to it and I don't even remember what happened an hour ago and I'm not thinking at all about what's happening next. It's just right now for me. And that's a really strong thing to be able to do and because it's such an overwhelming characteristic that I have, it's also a weakness. And so I have to remind myself that it is often helpful to prognosticate briefly and occasionally beyond the present moment. So I have get out of my head and think about other people and get out of right now and think about the implications of what we're doing in addition to what we're doing. Yeah, to consider to consider as other others, you know, worldview, so to speak, on what's happening as well, right? Yeah, and that's something that's, uh, I realized this as I was coming into coaching, that it's uh, a great weakness and strength also, that I was a complete nerd as a kid, and I've, I've come a long way, obviously, <laughs> since then. <laughs> But, uh, but to the extent that I have, and I wasn't, I'm not a gifted programmer. I'm just kind of decent at it, and I, I'm good at orienting myself in a problem space and finding the right questions to move forward. But uh, to the extent that I've been effective in a work context, whether as a developer or a product manager or what have you, it's because I have tried a bunch of things that were terrible, that were just sort of my default choices based on, you know, whatever stimuli I'd been exposed to when I was younger, and none of them worked very well. 
And then I intellected, what do I need to do differently? And I sort of slowly but carefully modified my behavior to things that seemed to work better. But because none of it came naturally and because I figured it out explicitly in my conscious mind, in my head, as it were, uh, I, you know, on one hand, it's a weakness that if I'm not conscious about it, I'm going to revert to those other behaviors. But it's also a strength as a coach that uh, I'm, I'm more like Phil Jackson than Michael Jordan. I'm not uh, overwhelmingly gifted, but I'm, I'm wily and I know how to position myself and I know how to make the team better. And that turns out to be, you know, eventually a strength. Yeah, yeah. Now that, that definitely speaks to me. I like the sports analogy. It works for me. I'm Phil. Thanks, Almanza. I feel better about myself today. I'm Phil Jackson, guys. I'm right on. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. <laughs> so it, can, I, can I get selfish for a moment and ask for your thoughts on a topic? Sure. So I have to start with a metaphor because we'll have to go there because I'm a metaphor person. Um, when I was first learning about coaching and realizing that coaching is a thing, I – imagined it kind of like a person you know out somewhere staring at a wall and it's a big wall and it's an intimidating wall and it represents a problem i mean it's something that is clearly blocking the person and the person has no i mean this wall goes as far as you can see you know and there's nothing available right and so what i kind of envisioned coaching was was so I come into the scene and I hand them a shovel or a hammer and I tell them what to do. Or I actually just go in there and knock a hole in the wall and boom, now we can get through. That's kind of like coaching, right? Well, no, not, 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 not really at all, right? And, and as I learned more about what it is, my metaphor switched to I show up and I just start you know, supporting the person and understanding the person. And in doing so, windows and doors start to appear in a wall. They could be all different sizes and shapes. Some doors may look intimidating, others may not. Some you could see through, but it doesn't matter. These are all lenses and things that we can see through where the person can decide, I want to open this door and see what's in there. Basically, they, they realize they have the tools, they have insights, they have things that they can use to solve their problem. So it's this wall that in coaching, we're creating all these, these windows and doors that just appear in it. And now the person has information, right? What do you do with people who want to take control, who, who don't want to, you know, engage other people in problem solving, they, or, or who, who don't want to have a collective strength. What do you do as a coach when the coaching environment is very much that as you walk up to this person and they're looking at the wall, they start doing the thing that you know is not going to help them get over the wall. Do you let them go? How do you bring them back? Like how, how can you, how can you really help somebody when they're in that frame of mind? It sounds like you're talking about inflicting help on somebody. Well, that's the first thing that came to mind. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> because some people don't want help. Some people are perfectly happy with their wall and they've defined themselves by being the person who fights the wall. But what if you they see have somebody no desire. What if you see somebody then yeah, you're right. And for me inflicting help kind of felt like my first the first metaphor where I come in and here, here's a shovel, dig right over here and let me show you how to dig and or hammer and this will break through the wall. To me, that kind of felt like inflicting help. I'm saying, what if you show up and you start looking, you know, cause you're the coach and you're saying, I, I've got experience in making these windows and doors appear in the problem in front of you. Um, but you see them <laughs> building this crazy contraption that you know is never going to work. And if anything, they could end up hurting them. You know, do you, do you just have to rescue them? Do you have to just jump in and tell them no? Is it really a safe place for the, I mean, is it, is it going to continue to model behavior that you know is not going to move things forward? What do you do when you know that the person is going in a direction that, you know, you, you can't tell them no, but at the same time, you don't want them to, you know, you don't <laughs> want to let them just continue in the behavior that they're, that they're practicing. So I think there's a few a few things you have to unpack yeah. with that situation, right? So if it's if it's truly a coaching an agile coaching situation where you have the authority around agile but you're there as a coach, um, I think it depends on the degree of danger, right? So if they're doing an experiment that is say they're backsliding, but there's a lesson to be had at the end of it if you let them do the backslide and it's not going to do more than a sprint's worth of damage then you probably let them go. Uh, but if it looks like they're actually going to put wedges between people, they're going to be destructive, I think at some point 
uh, we as coaches have to pull the ripcord and call the timeout and uh, and just jump in and point out, hey, this is an issue. And it's really, it's a difficult judgment call, right? It's one of those that, um, can we suffer this loss but but earn through learning through this failure, can we earn a greater victory later? And if not, if there's no greater victory to be had, that's probably the moment where you have to jump in and, and perhaps just throw the throw the red card and stop what's going on. So my, uh, I mentioned Nathan Arthur earlier, the, the person who was my first coach and continues to uh, coach me in life. And uh, he taught me something uh, as kind of an organizational jujitsu move that I'm thinking could apply in this case as well. So what he taught me was when there is pain that, say, say I'm a team member, and for some reason uh, the company that I'm in uh, or maybe my manager or something has made it very difficult for me to do the right thing. And uh, by default, my character is just take that on myself and do whatever it takes to make the right thing happen, even if that means I'm carrying more than my fair share. And what he taught me there is figure out who should feel the pain, who can do something about this, and make them feel it. Don't just, don't just feel it and eat it and deal with it. Make them feel the pain, whoever has the authority to change it. And generally, I think he was, he was intending that that be aimed upward in the organization. But as a coach, you might be able to use that. In this case, I'm thinking, if, if a person's behavior is damaging all by itself, or just non, not in a growth direction, Obviously, they're not looking to learn from me. I think that's the premise of the question, right, Zach? Yep. yep. So uh, it's maybe a risky gambit, but maybe what I could do, if I'm pretty convinced that the, uh, the consequences of the way they're behaving are poor, maybe I can do something to magnify that so that it's not just me that sees it. Mm-hmm. And then it'll be more clear that their behavior doesn't sustain itself well. And that maybe they're getting away with it because the consequences are currently contained. But if they were to be any worse, we'd be in big trouble. And maybe that's the kind of experience that would be uh, eye-opening for observers and also, you know, enough of a failure for the person who's behaving that way to consider alternative. Yeah. Well, and I guess the only thing to add to that um, is to be careful with who you are magnifying it too because if you're making someone look bad in front of their manager you're never going to gain their trust right so i agree with what you're saying all the time yeah but a certain amount for me is um i i don't think i personally would step in and interject if somebody feels like that's what they need to do because i know that's not going to help them learn anything i would rather uh take the approach identify their own pain. So whether it's somehow making it more visible, making the consequences of their actions more apparent to them, that definitely is important. But I think that there's an element of honoring their journey. You know, they, they're doing this for a reason and understanding why they're doing what they're doing can be really enlightening. You know, I find out things that I never would have thought of, but through a series of, you know, their past experiences, Experience, this is what they think is what they need to do. And so the more we can uncover, um, that's one of those things that kind of keeps me going when I'm dealing with people who make me want to bang my head against that brick wall. It, it's basically, to me, the, the retro prime des- directive. Mm-hmm. As I deal with quote unquote difficult people, I, I, have to, I have to truly believe that every person is doing the je- best job they could given their experience and their skills and the resources. I have to assume that they're the best they can. And that's something that helps me kind of get, uh, gain empathy, you know, grow my empathy, basically, and understand. Because without that understanding, I don't think I can really help anybody because they're not going to want my help. Yeah. That is a way better answer than mine. Thank you. No, I, I think they're all good. And I, I don't think we're... But what Diane is bringing out is it's empathy, but it's also creating a positive regard with everyone, regardless of your stance towards them, your, your opinions towards them. It's almost leaving judgment at the door, seeing them yes. as they are, and then trying to have empathy for where they're at. And it's incredibly hard. So this is not a simple skill. And so I, but I think, you know, the, the suggestions that everyone's brought forward, they all work in, 
in a, in different contexts, right? There are some cases where, um, yes, you have to highlight to higher up the chain because this action is going to do uh, profound damage. There's other times where if you can amplify the impact and make it noticeable just within the team, then sure, peer pressure might do its job. You know, other times we pull the rip cord and other times we, we make these evaluations. But the point is we're doing it from a stance where judgment's left behind, empathy's turned up, and it's all about serving the person and not ourselves, right? Yeah. Now, the, the context of this question comes from a, a recent situation where I found myself in a lose-lose situation with a person. And the person, from my perspective, was the total keystone of, of this team dynamic. I mean, the team was going to go where this person allowed them to go. So I found myself in a situation where I could either upset the person directly by making it so that, you know, the person would never really <laughs> never have any belief or reason to, you know, to, to, to want to work with me or, or, or to even, you know, believe in our relationship. Or I could reflect or mirror back the behavior to the team. This is, this is a bit of the peer pressure line that Amitai talked about um, of, of exposing it and realizing that it was all there in front of you. You had the people there. You just needed to take that chance. Um, but in doing so, you know, knowing that the person would be upset that I shared this request <laughs> that was between, you know, me and the person. And I opted with the latter, the peer pressure route. And I mean, it backfired. Um, it, it greatly did. And it makes me wonder, is it just another shade of, of gray? I mean, would it have been even worse if I would have, you know, taken the other option? But it, it's funny. It's the first time I've ever found myself in a situation where as a coach, I felt like I had no way out no matter what I did. And I didn't know what to do at all. I mean, I did the best. I, I, I responded in the way that was the most measured and the, as thoughtful as I could be. But it's funny. It's the first time I ever thought I got my, uh, I found myself in a situation with a team where I, I am where I am. And, and I'm at a dead end. I'm, I'm, I'm done either way. And it made me wonder how I got there. So I was just curious if there was, you know, other insights or thoughts that you both have, yeah. which gave me great, you know, thoughts to, 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 to consider. But, um, yeah. I have a thought to um, consider totally. about that one. Yeah. Yeah. You can't control other people. That's, that's the big lesson for me. Yeah. You can, you know, like literally bring the horse to water sometimes. <laughs> you cannot force people to want help and you just have to make peace with that some people are just not interested yet but you never know how you're going to impact by how you handle yourself that's why i think maintaining professional professionalism and being like to your post-it be kind no matter what because you don't know how you're influencing people yeah well, I and to it. diane's recent point about empathy uh I think what I took away from what you just said, Zach, is given that you found yourself kind of backed into a corner and you wondered what path got you there, imagine all the people who are inside that organization who find themselves backed into corners every day, and that's where they work. Yeah. You know, that's the, a lot of what you're all sharing with me is, is just making me re-realize and, and re-recognize that you know, I've, I've talked with companies be before that, you know, say, okay, cool. How long is it going to take for you to convert a team or to convert whatever? Like, what, you know, from one day to infinity. I mean, how it, it could be any amount of time. They're like, well, come on, you've, you've done this for a while. How long does it take? It's like, well, that kind of assumes that people are not free thinkers. Does, you know, wouldn't that be true? Like if, if there is a one way of doing it, it takes three months, then great. You can just buy the book, you know, like I, I don't, that, that doesn't seem to be true in my experience. So because people are, are free thinkers, uh, man, how hard is it to have a job where you realize that the perspective often that we go through is that the coach really is the constraint. Yeah, we brought the person in and they were just completely ineffective at being able to change anything. And maybe that's true. Or maybe the people are the constraint and change is about people. And really, when it comes to, to coaching, whatever direction we're going to go in is entirely the people. Right. And so maybe the most humane, the kindest thing we could do as a coach is was to not have pushed that, to not have tried to evoke change at that time, but just to talk, just to talk and get people to, to think nothing happened. And then the company says, OK, bye, Zach, you're done. You were you were ineffective. But maybe that was maybe that was the best thing that, that, that we could have done. 
And so it makes me wonder, in my scenario, when I made a decision to go in one of two directions, what, what decision could I have made that just would have been nothing more than to get somebody to think? Did I have to take an action? I don't know. I think there's, well, there's two things that, that you keep in mind, and the, these two things help me sleep at night at least. And, and the first one is, there is no end point. So there, there is no, uh, okay, you're agile, goodbye. You know, we're, we're always improving, we're always learning, uh, even, even as coaches. We're always trying new things, and there's no end point. I guess the day we die is when the coaching <laughs> is done. But, uh, and so for, but to a company, it's, well, the six months are up that we're going to pay you, so goodbye. So it seems like there's this end point, but the team's journey continues. And our journey as coaches continues. It's the financial aspect that has a temporary endpoint, right? So the first part for me is this is a continual journey that, that does not end. It just continues to grow and evolve and change. The second point is we're also coaching where we're at. So we're, we're called to meet people where they're at and, and help them along the way where they're at. But at the same time, we're coaching them from a very specific point and perspective in our careers as well. So we're at a we're at a specific place too, and you just have to be comfortable with that at some point. That that sometimes we're going to get it wrong, and and when we get it wrong, we have to own that quickly, apologize, and move forward. And uh, we're going to learn from it, and we're also progressing as well. And I think when I keep those two things in mind, it, it takes a lot of these bigger burden type thoughts and kind of shoves them aside for me the culture that they're in is what's driving their behavior. It's but what's it worded for, or perhaps uh, fear is driving out of. Um, I want to get to the point, as I've heard of other coaches who have been doing this a while, where before they even sign up with a client, they're talking to the team that they're going to work with. And so they're, they know before they sign the contract, whether a team is interested in being coached. Yeah. So there's things that we can do as coaches to say, no, you know what? I, I have some filters. I'm going to make sure that this team actually wants to work with me before I get in there. Now, we're not all in that position. Sometimes you're, you're doing your best to you know, get work, and uh, you can't always say no. Uh, I like to think that I'm, I've been able to pick and choose things that I want to do. Um, but like I've heard that idea, and I've never once interviewed the team that I'm going to work with. I haven't that to me is a risk. I need to get to that point where I can do that. I don't feel like I have the uh, coaching chance yet to, to pull that. I'm afraid clients are going to be like, no, why, you know, you don't, we're, we're interviewing a bunch of coaches. We're not going to let you talk to the team. I don't know. I have a bunch of fears around. I think it's a great idea. That's what we should be doing. I just that's, don't know how practical it is. Yeah, that's, it's so, <laughs> it just really speaks to a current. So, so the, the current work that, that I'm doing, I didn't get a chance to talk to the team. In fact, I had really nothing but just a pretty short phone call. Um, never actually. Yeah. And that's people. pretty typical. Yeah, no, you're right. You're yeah, right. That's really typical. Yeah. And, and when I made the request, Hey, I'm uncomfortable agreeing to this, to this contract, um, unless we can meet face to face and, and really, especially, I'd really like to talk to the teams that I know I'm going to be around just to understand what their view is, you know, and, and that, that's going to give me a lot of info. And they really balked at it. It was really way, 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 whoa, no, you know? And so in the end, I made the decision to just go with it. And well, I, I mean, I'd you were like brave to enough to ask, I'll give you credit to that for that, Zach. <laughs> well, th I mean, thanks. I, 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 I'd like to say that I'm going to be brave enough to refuse to ever take work again until I've had a chance to talk to the people who are going to be the most affected by what goes on. And you know, those are the teams, those are the people building and, and getting creative. Um, if I would have talked to them, I know I wouldn't be working where I am right, right now. I wouldn't have done it. I would have said, this is not the right place for me. I didn't yeah. have that opportunity yeah. and I paid for it. And it makes me wonder, I, I, I hope I can be there to where I can say no and feel okay about it. I hope I don't ever have to, you know, feel like, oh, I, I can't really ask, but that's an amazing point that you make is, is we, we should be talking about that. And maybe if we ask for it and the response is no, what does that tell us? What decisions can we make with that bit of information? Sure. Absolutely. What flag does that raise? Yeah. So guys, uh, I think at this point being the, uh, the great coaches that we are, we've totally exceeded our time oh. box. 
And uh, so I, I think at this point of the show, this is where we uh, we say adios to the topic, uh, and hopefully we pick it up again someday. But uh, at this point of the show, what I like to do is to have uh, the guests uh, plug anything that they have going on, anything that uh, is important to them to get in front of the listeners, and to put a little twist on this specifically for this show, you know, perhaps some resources that you would recommend to people uh, as they get started on their agile coaching journey uh, that you think could help uh, progress them along and, and help them uh, grow their coaching a little bit quicker. So, Diane, let's start with you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Can't wait for the next one. But if you could thank share you. your, your share your plugs and all of the uh, the great resources that I'm sure you have uh, at your disposal, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Well, I, I know we don't have much time, so I'll try to make it quick as far as resources in particular. Um, for me, uh, I'll start with Twitter, as simple as that seems. When I was thinking about quitting, I reached out to so many people on Twitter and engaged in so many conversations and got so many pointers in the right direction that I, I can't say where I would be if it weren't for Twitter. I won't call it luck, we'll call it serendipity, but <laughs> um, just following people and engaging with thought leaders was, was huge. Um, and the second thing is any chance you get to go to conferences, you guys know I'm a conference junkie, um, whether you're you know willing to get out there and present, um, which was something that I was lucky enough early on to cope with somebody who kind of got me out there and and, uh, I, you know, I guess I can plug that if anyone's interested in co-presenting, I'm very much uh, willing to be a mentor to people and, and help those who haven't done it before. Um, it's a great to meet people and to get your name out there, especially if you're going into coaching. Clients love the fact that you have speaking credentials on your resume, whether it's valid or not, I don't know. But <laughs> and that, that segues into my, my little bit of a plug. This year, I'm a program chair for the Agile 2016 conference. Um, I'm really excited about it. We've got a great program, great schedule already lined up. Uh, so I hope everyone listening tries to attend and get there because we have you know 200 plus sessions and it's going to be an awesome conference. So that's it for me. Yeah. I can uh, I can actually speak to Diane's coaching of uh, speakers. <laughs> actually. She she got me going as a as a conference speaker, provided great advice, and uh, truly appreciative of everything she did for me, uh, getting me started. I had a lot of fears and concerns and and questions, and you know I think we had met just once at uh, at Agile Coach Camp, and she spent yeah. uh, a number of hours with me, um, helping me along and making sure that I was going about it the right way. So super appreciative of that, and can definitely vouch for the fact that she will get you started. <laughs> uh, on the right foot and in, and in the right direction. So that's Thanks, awesome. Right. Oh, I, thank you. And, and as far as your suggestion about Twitter, if you are a prospective Agile coach or an Agile coach wannabe or whatever the phrase is, you have to follow George Dinwiddie on Twitter. Um, <laughs> so yes, that's, absolutely. <laughs> George is one of those people that, um, and there's a lot of great people out there. You know, George Dinwiddie, Esther Derby, Don Gray. I'm going to well, leave off... I got to plug Doc on Dev because Michael Norton, Doc Norton was my first coach. He's awesome. Um, he's a, he, he tweets a lot. Yeah. So a lot about leadership and coaching. And once you start, you'll find all sorts of other people out there. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll link to a few people out there that, uh, that we follow, but certainly everyone that, that Diane mentioned and the few I gave, uh, we watch regularly and, and they offer a lot of great things on Twitter. So really great suggestions there, Diane. Thank you. Mr. Boniker. Yeah. How about you? What do you what do you got? Bring the high heat. All right. So I, I resources. Okay. So to to play off of Diane uh, with conferences, make it an open space conference and present a you know convene a session on coaching. In my experience, every time somebody does that, there are many people at the conference also curious about what is an agile coach? What do they do? How do you do it? What are the, I mean, and there's people who are coaches 
that like to share that knowledge. <laughs> so the sessions always become pretty informative and popular, right? So go to an open space conference, talk about coaching, you know, convene a session, you'll get a lot of great information. Um, books. So Ryan, you've mentioned it a couple times tonight. Uh, for me, it was the seminal book that got me going and thinking about what this combination of agile mentoring and coaching is at, at teams and programs and people and whatever. Um, and so that's Coaching Agile Teams by Lisa Adkins. And, you know, Lisa writes in a way, she's a coaching mentor to me. And so she writes in a way that, I don't know, it just speaks to me in a way that makes me feel like I, 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 can, I can be great at this. I don't know what it is. I just read her writing and I go, ah, that connects with me. So it's a fantastic book. Um, and I would, yeah, encourage everyone, if you're curious about, you know, coaching, start there. Lisa's wonderful. Uh, so I will strongly second uh, Diane's recommendation about Twitter, and I, I'll link to a blog post uh, that I wrote last year called Confessions of a Twitter Completionist, in which I share the role that Twitter played in my changing careers. And I will strongly second Ryan's nomination of George Dinwiddie as someone to follow on Twitter. I will also throw in G. Paw Hill, Mike Hill, and yes. Esther Derby as people that I think have a high wisdom to word ratio. That's definitely. On top of that, uh, a few blog posts and one Agile in three minutes. Uh, I have how to get hired as a coach from last September, how to get decent at coaching a week later, and uh, earlier in the year, a post called how to develop humans that's a little bit about child rearing, sort of, but mostly about coaching, because I don't know anything about child rearing, not yet. Uh, and then finally, Agile in three minutes, episode 15, called Influence, which I think is ultimately everything that we do as a coach is influence. So those are my plugs. And we'll get links to all that in the show notes. Uh, very good blog post by Amitai, and uh, you guys will certainly enjoy them. I'm also, I think we're going to spend a little time and get a Twitter list set up. Uh, I'd like to get that going so that people have a good idea of uh, where to look and, and perhaps a, an introductory list of people to follow because I think we've offered a handful of people that are great to, uh, to start with. As far as uh, I go, you know, Love all the uh, the comments and resources and interactions tonight. Um, and so to add to what I think is a key theme for us, it's really the why. We're getting to the why of what we're doing. We're getting to the why of what we're coaching, uh, getting to the why of Agile. There's a book out there uh, called Scrum Mastery by Jeff Watts. And it, uh, I think it is the uh, best book on understanding the reasons behind what a scrum master and to a, a lesser extent, why what an agile coach does. And he really gets into uh, empowering teams, taking it to the team and, and growing uh, agilists in such a way that they are self-sufficient and truly self-organizing. And it's really just a, a wonderful book that I don't think it's enough credit and enough exposure. So scrum mastery is my uh, big resource plug along with uh, Twitter and the people that we follow um, as far as plugs go, uh, I'm, I'm uh, speaking at Agile 2016 this year, so I'll be presenting uh, the business of Agile, where we get into the, the claims of better, faster, and cheaper, and we try to, to tear those apart and see if they're true or not, and perhaps replace them with uh, a few other words that may make more sense in an Agile context. So looks like there's some initial uh, interest in the talk. I hope that all of you coming to Agile 2016 give it a look. Uh, I would love to have a, a room full of people ready to to interact and, and learn about uh, the better, faster, and cheaper aspects of Agile and whether or not that's true. So that's going to be my plug for the week. Uh, Amitai, Zach, and Diane really uh, enjoyed this conversation. It went by way too fast, which is why, from a timing perspective, we went way too long. But uh, really appreciate all of you sharing uh all of these insights and thoughts and just being vulnerable and present and, and really authentic as we talk about these topics. I think it really shined through and, and hopefully our listeners out there uh, were able to take a few notes and get something out of this because it is, it is, a, it, it is a, a popular question. How do you become an Agile coach? What's the path to it? And I think the big thing we learned tonight is there's no right or wrong path. It's really uh, what you bring to the table, how present you are, and uh, whether or not you can listen. Right, Amitai? What? <laughs> exactly and with that everyone we hope you have a great night thank you for being here and we'll catch up with all of you next time thanks for listening to Agile for Humans let's keep the conversation going drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit 
agileforhumans.com. <laughs>